5, and, so, and encouraging one another, and so much the more as you see the day, or the day of the Lord, the Lord's return coming close. And so she decided to be faithful. And friends, she prayed that God would send them a, a pastor. And finally, uh, a young man who was in Bible Institute many miles from there heard that there was a need for a pastor in a little church out in a little pueblo in the state of Coahuila. And that there was one lady who had been praying that God would send a pastor. So he decided by faith, him and his wife and his young family, to go out there and start serving the Lord. And they began knocking on doors and visiting. And little by little, people started coming. People started getting saved and baptized. And pretty soon the church was growing. And pretty soon there were a lot of folks coming. And then we had that, years later, we had that outreach. And there were more than 50 people that accepted Christ right there in that little pueblo in less than a week. And you see, friends, none of that would have ever happened had it not been for the faithfulness of one dear, precious Christian Mexican lady named Bertha. And friends, so the next time you think that your life doesn't count, that your testimony doesn't count, that nobody's listening, so it's not worth it, so you might as well just quit. Think about her testimony. Amen? Think about the fact that God's called each of us to be faithful to Jesus Christ, to serve Him, to be obedient to Him, to be an overcomer in Jesus, whether everybody around us is forsaking Him and living in rebellion and living in wickedness. It doesn't matter. It's what you are going to do for Jesus Christ. Amen? It's what God's going to do through you as you yield to Him and you commit your life to follow and serve Him wholeheartedly. Amen? 100% commitment. And friends, that's what we need today in the church. We were talking about that in the Sunday school this morning. What's missing? Why aren't people excited? Why aren't people coming to church? Why is it no big deal whether you go to church or not go to church for many families in our city today? You say, why is that? Friends, something's missing. Amen? Something's missing. And that which is missing greatly is faithfulness to Jesus Christ. Amen? Being faithful to Christ. You see, you might have a wonderful husband or wife, and, and God bless you. you need to be we need to be faithful to our husband and wife. Amen? And you might have a great boss, and you might have a great career, and you might be working for a great company, and hey, it's great to be faithful and loyal and, and uh, be a great worker and, and be somebody who's achieving in your career. That's awesome. But friends, there's somebody that we need to achieve more for than our boss at work. <laughs> and even more for than, than our spouse, or our children, or our loved ones, or our grandparents, or our parents. It's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, the, before I give you the seven things that we must to continue, I just want to clarify one thing. Open your Bibles with me. We're, keep your text, Hebrews 13, 1 through 6. But we want to clarify something in Matthew chapter 20, 23 real quick. Matthew chapter 23. Open your Bibles to Matthew 23. And remember that Jesus <laughs> was, was instructing the disciples about Phariseeism. And he said, now remember Jesus had told the disciples previously, he said, beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees, right? Phariseeism was legalism. That was basically serving God according to the rules and commands of men. The theologies of men, the philosophies of men, rather than God's word. Uh, fair, uh, Sadduceeism <laughs> was the opposite. It was kind of like the theological liberalism of the time. That is that everybody's fine. You're okay. I'm okay. We're all okay as long as we worship, believe in God. And it doesn't really matter what you believe. Just, just be a, a believer in God and all will be well. There's people that believe that. It's kind of kind of like called the universalism, the doctrine or belief of universalism of our time. And so uh, those are kind of the two extremes in our day as well. But, friends, notice what Jesus said in context of this. In Matthew 23, he said, uh, and notice what he said in, in verses 7 through 9. He said this, or 7 through 10. He said, In greetings of the markets, and do call of men rabbi, rabbi. He said, verse 8, But be not ye called rabbi, or teacher, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are, what does that say? Verse 8. Brethren or brothers, right? And then look what he says in, in, in the next verse. He says, 
And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even who? Christ. So what's, what's Jesus saying here? He says, look, we only have one spiritual master, and that's our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And all ye are what? Brethren. What does that mean? Now, he's talking to the apostles. He's talking to Peter, James, and John. He's talking to the pillars of the church. He's, called, he's talking to the, those who, who, who he God inspired to write the epistles of the New Testament. And he said, all you are brethren. What's he saying? You're all equal. There's not none of you that's more important than the other one. Amen. Don't matter how rich you are. Doesn't matter how much education you have. It doesn't matter what your history is. We are all brothers and sisters implied in Christ Jesus. Amen? And we have one master, one teacher. Now, we have many Bible teachers in the church. Amen? But we have only one true spiritual teacher in the church, and his name is who? Jesus Christ. Amen? So, so the reality is, is that we're to worship and follow and serve and keep our eyes on who? Jesus Christ. See, if you keep your eyes on men or on women, you will become discouraged really fast because you'll see the inconsistencies in other brothers and sisters in Christ. I had to learn this a long time ago because I learned as a young Christian, wow, I better, I better just keep my eyes on Jesus, keep serving Jesus because, man, people will disappoint you. If you get your eyes on a horizontal perspective and start looking at people around you, you're going to get discouraged, right? Yes, discouraged. But if you keep your eyes on Jesus Christ, said, I'm following Jesus. I'm serving Jesus. I'm getting up this morning to serve my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let each day be for Jesus Christ. Amen? So when we live each day for Jesus Christ, at the end of the day, we're going to have joy. We're going to have peace. We're going to say, hey, this was a good day. You say, why? Because if you live to please people all around you all the time, you will be one disappointed, frustrated, resentful kind of person. Amen? Because you can't, I had to learn a long time ago, you can't please all the people all the time. Amen? You do your best, but a lot of people aren't. But if you live each day, to everything you do to please Jesus Christ, at the end of that day, you are going to be encouraged. Amen? You're going to know, hey, this was a great Sunday. Amen? You say, why? Because I served Jesus Christ today. Amen? This is a great Monday tomorrow because I serve my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ today. I got to share a gospel track. I got to speak a word for Jesus. I got to do something, oh, an act of Christian love in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, if you live each day like that, you will be encouraged continually. And we all go through valleys. We all go through discouraging times. We all go through hardships and health issues and financial problems and, and relative issues and relationship issues. But you know what? Jesus called us to serve and, and glorify and exalt Him and focus on Him every day. And if we keep our focus on Him, you will continue on in the Christian faith. Amen? You will continue to serve Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. But if you start focusing on other people and all that's going on in this world full of sin and injustices and wickedness and lies and false philosophies and false movements and false doctrines of devils, you will become one discouraged person. Amen? Amen. But Jesus, on the other hand, He's calling us to continue in the faith. Amen? He's calling us to continue in some things here. And so notice what Hebrews chapter 13 verses 1 through 6 says. He says, let brotherly love continue. The first thing that he calls us to continue in is brotherly love. And love is lacking in our society today, isn't it? We were talking about that in Sunday school. Everybody's like taking sides and, and wanting to like be against one and another, you know. And you say, why is that? Because we have sin natures. Everybody has a sin nature. Everybody struggles with pride. Everybody struggles with, with thoughts of, of low self-worth and all those kind of things. And so I've got I to be, feel better about myself. So, so that's why a lot of these movements start. Because people are confused, frustrated, and they don't know Jesus. And they don't know the peace of Christ in their own hearts and lives. When you have the peace of Christ in your heart, you can say, okay, I can handle today, I can handle tomorrow because Jesus is with me. Amen? He's not going to leave me or forsake me. Now look, the first thing we need to continue in is love. Because in the last days, we find in, in Matthew chapter 24, for instance, uh, verses 12 to 13, that in the last days, the days just before the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, there's going to be a time of apostasy. We know that. But the Bible says because iniquity or because sin is going to be increasing, the love of many will wax what? Coal. Will become coal. 
And isn't that true in our society? There's a lot of people that are very cold-hearted. Very cold-hearted. I see. I look and I listen to people. I listen to people. I say, man, that's cruel. How can people be so cruel in our time? And they, they think cruel thoughts. And they think a lot of, there's a lot of anger and cruelty. And there's a lot of coldness. Total insensitivity to the needs and, and the, the hurts and the discouragements of other people around him. You see, how can we be like that? You know, God didn't call us to be uh, evolutionary evolved robots. Amen? <laughs> I'm glad I don't believe in evolution. I, I wouldn't be a very good evolutionist. Uh, I don't have enough faith to believe in evolution. I'm sorry, guys. I just look at everything around me daily. Uh, this last uh, month, my wife had an opportunity to be with me for three weeks. I've been here mostly doing solo preaching uh, for these last six weeks. But she was with me about half the time, three weeks. And we were out enjoying some of the nature, God's creation. And I was pointing out, I said, look at how beautiful this place. Missouri is a beautiful state, isn't it? Amen. Well, Kansas is too. I was born and raised in Kansas, but Missouri is awesome. We just, there's a lot, of, a lot of natural beauty out there, so God's creation. So we go over to Missouri and go to these parks and all these places and rivers. It's like, this is absolutely beautiful. How could anybody deny this complex creator with all the complex designs and all this beauty that's all around? It's like, praise God. I just kept praising the Lord. And uh, I didn't even come out of a Pentecostal church, brothers and sisters, but I, I just keep praising the Lord. Amen. I every time I see this stuff, I say, this is awesome. Who could, who could design and create stuff like this? It's sure not mankind. We can't do this stuff. And it's sure it in the Martians or the UFOs or the, or the um, aliens or whatever from outer space, okay? It's an almighty God who created the heavens and the earth and all the things therein. And he did it in six days, friends. That's awesome. Read Genesis chapter 1. Still believe Genesis 1 is true. And so, but, you know, it's easy to let our love grow cold because... People hurt us all around us. People are doing stuff and say stuff to us that really is, is hurtful and discouraging, right? And if you've never gone through that, just, just go to work at some places and, you, and you'll get it sooner or later, right? There's some jobs that are easier than others, okay? But, but I tell you, you, all you have to do is be out in the world a little while and you get, we get dirtied. We get soiled with the world, don't we? And it can be very discouraging as Christians. But you know what? He says, he says, continue in brotherly love because we got to keep encouraging one another, serving. Hey, it's fun to come to church because you get to serve Jesus and you get to serve others this morning. And you know, some of the happiest people in this church today are people who came here to serve Jesus like that video talked about. It's not about us. We don't come to get what we can get from church. It's coming ready to serve. Say, Jesus, how can I serve today? How can I serve you? How can I serve my brothers and sisters in Christ? And you'll notice some of the people with the biggest smiles and the biggest uh, hearts and, and that have joy in the Holy Spirit today are those who came here this morning with a purpose to serve. I'm looking at Sister Candace right in front with a big smile, amen? And seeing you know, the other ones that came here to serve. Phyllis was here the earliest, amen? And she has a smile. You say, why? Because there's a joy in serving Jesus Christ, amen? And if you come to church with that perspective, you're going to come with a heart of love. Hey, I want to serve. How can I serve you today? Amen? That's missing in the world today. That love just isn't out there. And we need more of that, amen? To shine Christ through actions of Christian love daily, one to another. And so then secondly, notice, it says continue, we need to continue in praying, <clears throat> or excuse me, continue in Christian hospitality. Verse 3, or verse 2. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. I've heard stories where people, and I've, I've heard pastors in Mexico share testimonies where they actually, actually thought that they had an angel show up to their to their, uh, uh, to their house or to their church or some experience they had where the person just disappears and, and they ask, hey, who was that? Have you ever seen that person? He was just here. I said, no, we never saw the person. You know? It's like, how many, how many of you heard testimonies like that where somebody just shows up and you say, this person is not natural. It's not, this is not a person from here. This is a person from up there because there ain't no, no way this guy could do the stuff he's done. And nobody finds him later. They say, what happened to that person? They're right here. You know, the people really do have experiences with angels. Now, we don't worship angels. We don't exalt angels. We exalt Jesus Christ. As all angels are called to worship and exalt our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1 uh, teaches us that. So, but be ready. Be, be willing to extend Christian hospitality. We are so thankful. And Fanny, my wife, tells me, she says, I'm so thankful for the church, to the uh, families and the uh, Christian 
uh, pastors and their families and others in the churches in the United States that invite us to stay with them when we're in the United States because that saves us a lot of money, friends. And the Bible says it is, a point, it is, uh, it is uh, required of a man that, that a, steward be, a steward that a man be found faithful. So we want to use our, our, our money carefully. We, don't, we have a very low support level, so we have to anyway. But so when church, uh, churches and families open their, their uh, homes to us or open to Christian hospitality to us, that is a huge blessing. Number one, the Christian fellowship, and also it helps us uh, preserve the finances so that we can use that to minister to people and not use all of our finances on motels. And you guys know what it's like to travel. You can really run up a big expensive bill on motels in a hurry. And I've done it in the past and I much prefer <laughs> staying with Christian families and, and churches that have apartments and things like that. It's a huge help to us. So we're very thankful for the Christian hospitality that's extended to us. And I'm sure if you talk to any missionary uh, families or missionaries, they'll tell you the same thing, how much we appreciate that Christian hospitality. And so then thirdly, we're to continue in praying for Christians, our brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the world, who are being persecuted and imprisoned for the name of Christ. Notice what it says in verse 3, remember them that are in bonds as bound with them and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. You guys have heard, how many of you heard of uh, Pastor um, um, Andrew Brunson, who is from North Carolina, who is being imprisoned right now in Iran. Have you heard of him on Christian radio? We need to pray for him or his family. He's been unjustly imprisoned and targeted because of his Christian faith. And so there are other Christians like him all around the world that are imprisoned, they're persecuted, they're beaten, they're tortured, they're taken to prisons in uh, Islamic countries and communist or Marxist uh, dominated uh, countries. And uh, many times they disappear, and like in China, North Korea, and nobody ever sees them and hears from them again. They disappear. They're a missing person. They're not officially declared to be dead or murdered. They're not in that statistic, but they're in the missing person statistics. And so that happens all the time throughout the world, friends. And it says that we are to remember them as being bound with them. Are we really praying for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ in places like Pakistan that was mentioned this morning, where you're regarded as a third-class citizen if you're a Christian, where you're persecuted, where you're denied opportunities of education and health care, you're denied opportunities of work and employment so that it makes it very hard for you to make enough to live on and to feed your family? That's what our brothers and sisters in Christ are experiencing all over the world. Are we in solidarity with them? Are we praying for them? Are we seeking to be an encouragement to them? Are we trying to do what we can to help them? And I know that we would, if you were in their shoes, I know you would appreciate that love, wouldn't you? And that encouragement. And so I'm all for that. Now, <clears throat> thirdly, Oh, that's, I'm sorry, that's number three. Number four, continue in sexual purity. Number uh, Verse four, notice what it says. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Now, there are a lot of people in our society would like us to clip, uh, just cut that verse right out of the New Testament, right? Because they prefer to just kind of live the way that they want to. Now, friends, the word whoremongering here is referring, in, in, in my King James Bible, refers to the word uh, fornications or fornication. That means having sex outside of biblical marriage. Now, it says marriage is honorable in all things. And we want to clarify to you, by the way, that homosexual marriage is not marriage. Okay? That is a falsification of marriage. Okay? Um, pedophilia or incest or any of these sexual fornications that are listed in Leviticus chapter 18 in the Old Testament are not in any way to be considered marriage. Don't, deceive, don't let yourself be deceived by the society around us. Now, in recent years, we've got gay marriage. We've got all kinds of new things that are coming into the society. Friends, that's not true marriage. Marriage in the Scripture, in the Hebrew Scripture and in the New Testament, is always a covenant between one God, our Lord God and Savior, our Jehovah God, Yahweh of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. It's a covenant between Him and one man and one woman. Read Hebrews, uh, Matthew chapter 19, 1 through 6. Read Mark chapter uh, uh, 10, uh, verses 1 through 10. Read uh, Luke chapter 21. It's always a covenant between God, one man, masculine, and one woman, Feminine. There's no confusion, okay? Uh, by the way, there's no such thing as transgender <laughs> in, in the Bible. 
There, there's a he or there's a she. Amen? You're either a he or you're a she. You don't have to be confused about that. Okay. God's created you as a he or has created you as a she, as a man or a woman. You don't have to be afraid about being a man. You don't have to be afraid about being a woman. That's natural. That's how God's created you. Don't uh, get into gender confusion. Amen? Because there's a lot of that going on today in our society. Young people are confused. Okay? It, the, what, the best things you can do is make sure your sons have a godly man to mentor them. If you are a single parent and you have sons, make sure that your son's getting mentored and spending time with other godly Christian men or pastors, somebody that could encourage and stream and help them identify themselves as men. It's okay to be a young man. Amen? Don't get confused because that's the devil's attempt to confuse your mind. He wants to deceive you. He's the great deceiver. He wants to think you're something other than what you are not. And that is deception. It is a lie. And the devil is the author of all lies. Read John 8, 43 through 44. So friends, I, I, I can't, I'll be honest with you. As a, as a Bible-believing Christian and preacher, I stand clearly for biblical marriage, for biblical morality, for biblical uh, gender identity. Those are all things that are good, wholesome. Amen? I mean, when I, when I was a young man and we played in, in sports, uh, our coach would tell us, he would say, get out there and play like a man. He said, don't you be, act like a sissy. And I realized, that's right, I'm a man. Get out there and act like a man. Get out there and play like a man. Now, I'm sorry, ladies, I don't mean to discourage you. By the, but I mean, this is the kind of stuff that used to be when I, we were younger. Amen, Brother Strong? I don't know if you remember that. We're, our coaches in sports and stuff. I mean, it's like, you're a man or you're a woman. What are you going to be here? <laughs> <laughs> you get, you gotta get with. You better get. You know, you're a man, or, or you're not gonna be on the team. Okay, I'm sorry, ladies. I mean, or if you're a lady, you're gonna be on the ladies' team. Man, ladies' volleyball, ladies' basketball. There's a difference. Men's basketball, men's football. Okay, so there's a difference. <laughs> Amen. And it's a good difference, friends. That's a good thing. That's a beautiful thing. I mean, when I was younger, I, I'm just being honest with you. The ladies were really ladylike. They wore beautiful ladylike stuff and pretty ladylike heels and pretty ladylike dresses and pretty ladylike hair things and all that stuff is awesome, amen? I mean, we just, us men, we just think that's cool, amen? How many of you guys think that's cool? Just raise your hand. I mean, that's, that's really good to see a beautiful woman who's a feminine and, and wants to identify herself as a woman, really feminine. It's like, wow, that is so cool, amen, to us. But if you're confused about that, that's going to confuse the men, amen? And then men, we got to dress like men. We got to be like men, amen? Or the women are going to be confused. Well, what is this guy exactly, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, I, all I know to tell you is what my past was, my experiences as a young man. But, you know, so continue in sexual purity. You say, now, preserve. If God gives you a, la a wife, a, a lady that you fall in love, and you, and you, man, make sure that you make a marriage covenant with her, a commitment to stay true to her. Amen? And women to their husbands, because we live in a very adulterous and wicked, fornicating society. There's a, good a lot of men out there have no regard for your wife in the workplace. They will hit on her and try to seduce her into sexual immor immorality. And the same thing with women toward men. It's just the way. And, and nowadays, I had to warn my daughters when they went to college, because they went to secular colleges, Brother Strong. And that was a challenge, right? But I mean, God's able to help in any situation. But uh, both my daughters, I warned them, hey, watch out for the women that hit on you too, you know? <laughs> definitely. And the young men. The young men will definitely hit on you. But now you've got to warn your daughters about the win men and the women because of that, that we're living in that kind of society now. I mean, we're getting closer and closer to a Sodom and Gomorrah, tragically. But it's going to accept there be had, had been a remnant in the United States of true godly men and women, this country would be as Sodom and Gomorrah today, friends. Read Isaiah chapter 1. The days of Isaiah, the same as our days. People are so confused and wicked and, and, and corrupted and perverted in their minds that they cannot r r distinguish between right and wrong, truth and falsehood. So let's continue in sexual purity. Let's make sure that we stay away from pornography. Amen? Let's wait, uh, stay away from dirty movies. Stay away from stuff that will stir you your flesh to get involved out in a relationship with another person outside of biblical marriage. Now, God created sex to be enjoyed in a marriage relationship, amen? 
And that's a beautiful thing. It's a totally natural thing. And I hope you get married. I hope you have a honeymoon that just never ends. Amen? I just hope you have that kind of a marriage. God bless you. And uh, I think that's awesome. You're a good example to all of us. But friends, let's save it for marriage. Amen? That's the truth. You see, if a man really loves you, he will, he will commit to marrying you. And being a responsible man and father and to love you and to make that commitment to you. If he doesn't want to make that to commitment to you, what's he saying? He wants to be gratified with you for a little while and then toss you aside when he finds a prettier lady. Or when it's convenient for him. Okay? Now, I told my daughters that. And I'll still tell any of you girl, late, young ladies, or <laughs> you're about the age of my daughters. That was exactly what I tell my daughters. Okay? And I see Brother Strong would be in agreement. Amen? Brother Strong and other, Brother Marcus and all the men here. But you know what? Look what it says. So let's continue in sexual purity by His grace and power. And if you have been involved in immorality, sexual immorality in the past or fornication, do not let that discourage you from serving Jesus now. Amen? You've been called to be an overcomer. That is a common sin in a society. But fornication is not the unpardonable sin. God can forgive you for that. And adultery. Do not live in the past. Live as, a, as an overcomer now in Christ Jesus. Amen? And be walking with Jesus every day. Let him use you and give you and, and the gifts, spiritual gifts, that you can use to serve others in the body of Christ. Now, also, look, look what this says. Um, and by the way, we are forgiven. We're not perfect. We are forgiven. Amen? And God's now called us to obedience to him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. Amen? So let's keep on in obedience to him. The testimony of all true Christians of the last days before the second coming of Christ, I believe, will be that they will have the testimony of keeping the faith of Jesus Christ and the commandments of God. We take those things seriously. Amen? Our faith, our testimony of obedience to Christ and obedience to his commands. And one of those commands is to don't commit adultery. Amen? Don't be living in adultery. So look what it says now. The next thing we want to consider is we need to continue, number five, in being content and abstaining from <laughs> covetousness. Okay? Covetousness. Now it's really a really good thing to be content. What does it mean to be content? It means to be at peace, be satisfied with what you already have, who you are in Christ Jesus and his calling in your life. It means to be content with the things that God's provided you and not always be coveting other things from other people. You see, the first thing, you know, it's really amazing. Um, a lot of times people will buy a new car, a really beautiful new car, be beautiful new truck. And so you take that over to your friends, or your relatives, and man, they want to see it, right? We want to see it. And if you're a car dude, like I am, a truck dude, you want to see this stuff. Oh, let me pop that hood. I want to see the engine. Isn't that beautiful? Look at that chrome. Oh, isn't that pretty? I just, I mean, it's hard, you know, as men. You look at these things, oh, this is beautiful. And then what, so, what starts happening in our hearts? Oh, I want one like this. <laughs> I want one like this. And we've got a car that's maybe 10 years old or something like that. And, but it's paid off. Amen. We're debt free. So the temptation is, let's go buy a new car. When by using that, continue to use that old car as long as we can, we're going to be staying out of debt and we're going to have funds free to use to serve the Lord in a greater way, in a greater capacity. So what's, what's the better witness? What's the better work? Well, the better work is to stay out of debt. <laughs> the better work is use what you got <laughs> as long as you possibly can. Fix it and keep using it until it's gone. All right. I had a van that became gone down at the border. And I prayed for over a year later, and then God gave me another van. <laughs> but I had to wait for over a year for the other van. <laughs> and uh, sometimes God makes us wait, and we patient. We say, oh, Lord, I'd like to have a van. <laughs> well, if he, God wants us to have a van, he'll provide a van. Amen? But if it's not his will, it's better to say, hey, I want to be content with this little, little car I've got right here. It uses a lot less gas. Amen? It costs less at the gas station. So, so we need to learn to be people who are content with what God has provided and not always be desiring what others have around us. Because if you get into that trap of covetousness, you will be totally unsatisfied. You will be discontent. And a lot of ladies do this. Because I know you ladies, the temptation for us is vehicles, as guys a lot of times. But for the ladies, they go into all the clothing stores, right? <laughs> it's like my wife. 
when we go shopping, it's like, okay, well, if I go shopping, it's like 15 minutes. <laughs> I got my list and, okay, zip, 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 zip. Okay, it's done. When ladies go shopping, what happens, ladies? You tell us. <laughs> you kind of hang out there, right, for a while. You just kind of, I got to see this, just experience this, touch this, and go over and check out the purses, and go over and check out this. And so if you're a married man, you've got to learn patience, amen? <laughs> you go shopping with your wife, just let her check stuff out, no problem. Just stay cool, amen? You're in the AC, just stay cool inside that, that shop, all right? I was at a shoe store the other day, and my wife um, was deciding that she wanted to go in to check. She was going to buy one pair of shoes. She's going to check for one pair of shoes. I'm telling her she's not here, so she can, I can get by with it, I think. But, <laughs> so she's like hanging around there. I don't know how long we were there. It's like, so finally, I sat down on the little shoe thing, and I said, I told the lady that says, I, is it okay for me just to sit here? And I said, no problem. So I just sat there for I don't know how long, and she's like going around checking all the shoes and said, feel and all this. Like, I, it's like, okay, this was an experience for my wife. <laughs> For me, it was like this sitting down for a long time deal, you know. <laughs> but, you know, that's the kind of thing that in our hearts we wrestle with that, don't we? It's real for men and women. We have different things that we desire. But the main thing is to ask God what He wants for us, amen? Sometimes we can save a lot of money by getting something we really need. And we need, we need clothing, we need food, stuff like that. But ask God what He wants for your clothing, amen? Sometimes it have good pants, you know. You can have durable pants that cost half, half or less the price than these expensive high-class pants, you know, that last you about six or seven months. <laughs> All you have to do is run up against something and you tear it real easy, right? So let's learn to be content. We need to continue being content in the days in which we're living. Now look, also number six, look, we need to continue to let the Lord be our helper. Amen? Now, when you trust in other people to be your helper, you are going to become disappointed and discouraged really fast. Amen? Now, it's interesting. We find some verses in the Scripture about this, and I think it's interesting. Look what Hebrews 13, verse 6 says. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Is the Lord your helper today? Have you accepted the Lord Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Is He living in your heart through the person of the Holy Spirit? If He's your helper, He is going to be your helper every day. You don't have to get stressed out. You don't have to get worried. I like the little sign that says, uh, worry less and pr uh, pray more and worry less. Amen? And so if we trust God, He will take care of us from day to day. He'll provide what we need. If we rush ahead of God, we're going to get in trouble. Amen? Now, so if he is our helper, think about the, the, how many ways he helps us. We must trust the Lord to help us. Uh, look, open your Bibles with me to Psalm 28, verse 7. Look what Psalm 28, 7 says here. Beautiful Psalm. Psalm 28, 7. What does it say here? The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song I will praise him. So he is our helper. Now look over to Psalm chapter uh, 54, verse 4. This is beautiful. Psalm 54, verse 4. What does it say here? It says, Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is with me, them that uphold my soul. So he could, the, the, the David, King David could, could declare that the Lord is my helper. What does that mean? That means he's going to help me in all aspects of my life from day to day. He's going to be my teacher. He's going to be my counselor. Amen? Isn't he our mighty king? Isn't he the prince of peace? Isn't he our counselor? Singular, capital C. Hey, the best counselor you can get is Jesus Christ. Amen. According to Isaiah 9, 6. He's the mighty God. That means he's the almighty one. There's nothing too hard for him. He can help us whatever our circumstances, whatever hardship, whatever struggle we're having in our lives or temptation, he can help us to be overcomers and to go ahead and continue serving Christ through that issue. Amen? And to be an overcomer of addiction or any issue that we're facing. And then look what it says. Look at Psalm 63, verse 7. We're in Psalms. Beautiful, beautiful verses of promise. Psalm 63, verse 7. Look what David says here. Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. Kind of like a mother hen caring for her little, little uh, chick. 
And that's what uh, David's, you know, the analogy, the, the imagery that David's giving here is that he's, I'm under the wings of God. I'm, I'm, he's, care, he's protecting me like a mother hen would protect its chicks. It's awesome. He has been my help. And then look at, look at other, some other Psalms. Psalm 63, verse 7. Let's just, we just, yeah, 63, 7. And then let's look at uh, Psalm 72, 12. Look what it says in Psalm 72, 12. A little farther up. And he says, For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also, and him that has no helper. If you think you have no helper, look to the Lord, because he will be your helper. Amen? That's pretty awesome to say, God is my helper. Because if God, if, if the Lord God of heaven, the Almighty One, is your helper, that means that he's going to help you in whatever situation you're in from day to day, however low it seems. Hey, Lord, you're my helper, so that means what? That means that I can trust you. I don't have to be worried and fearful. Now remember the 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says that, that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So that implies that a spirit of fear doesn't come from God. It comes from the devil. The devil wants to frighten you into being silent, not witnessing for Christ, not inviting other peoples to, to church here. Not sharing your testimony, what God's doing for you in your life. He wants to intimidate you into silence. And he will use his children, those who do not know him, and those who are adversaries to the Christian faith, to try to intimidate you and to bully you into silence. And that's what the, the same strategy the devil's using throughout the world. I know an experience I had last year. I was down in the streets in a, in a, in a barrio, in a ghetto there in in Mexico, and I had a group of young guys that was passing the, in front of me in the street, passing in front of our house. And these guys had kind of a, 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 of a pretty rough reputation in the, in the neighborhood. And people usually didn't mess with them. They didn't go out, they didn't say anything to them. They stayed away from them. And I thought to myself, man, those guys could, they might attack me. I started thinking, they might assault me if I go out there and start witnessing to them. And I thought, but then the devil would win if I don't go out there and witness him because the devil's intimidating me to be fearful of this gang of young men. And so I grabbed my tracks and I said, I don't want the devil to win today. I grabbed my tracks, ran out there in the streets and ran after it because they were about a half a block up the street. But I wrestled with fear there for, a, few, for, for, for some, a little bit of time. And I said, no, I know that Jesus called me to be a bold witness. I, he's not giving me a spirit of fear to be intimidated and so I ran out there with my tracks, and I ran out to <laughs> and the, first, the biggest one, I said, I'm going to talk to the biggest one first, the toughest looking guy. Because if you usually, if you ever witness to a, ga a gang of uh, young guys like that, always talk to the toughest, biggest, meanest looking one first, okay? Because if you don't, they won't respect you. Talk to the little guy your size. The big guy will say, ah, I man, you're a whip. Okay? But you talk to the biggest, toughest guy, and it usually, usually works. I mean, no, I'm not just saying. <laughs> it was my strategy. I don't know. God gave me the grace and help that day. But I started with him. I said, you know what? I said, the Bible says you, you must be born again. Did you know that? Have you ever heard what it means? To be, have you ever read from the Scripture that you need to be born again and what that means? And he looked at me and says, huh, no. And so I started to talk to the other ones. I said, do you guys know that the Bible says that we've got to be born again to enter into God's kingdom? Now, we can't go to heaven unless we get born again. So wouldn't you like to learn what that mean, being born again means? Wouldn't you like to go to heaven one day instead of the other place? And the guys were all attentive, and they all listened. Really. So I started giving them tracts and started witnessing, sharing about Christ. And by the time I ended, those guys were just listening so well. I thought, now what in the world was I afraid of? But in my flesh, I was saying, oh, man, it's just one of those guys gets, gets angry at me. Man, they're going to assault me and beat the tar out of me. I'm going to leave, leave me dead in the street there in a, in a pool of blood. My flesh was in fear because <laughs> these guys are bigger than me. There's a whole bunch of them. But the Lord's laid on my heart. They need to get saved. Those are the same young men that Jesus came to die for. Those are the same young men that if somebody doesn't witness to them, where are they going to end up? They're going to end up in hell or in jail, one of the two, or both eventually. So they've got to get saved. And so God laid on my heart. I had the most incredible battle with that that day. I remember in my spirit, my, in my flesh, I felt afraid to go out there. <laughs> 
But in my spirit, the Lord says, go out there, <laughs> go get them. And so I literally ran to catch up with them because they were half a block away, like I said, because I was a coward for about, for a few seconds there at least. But friends, that's the good news number seven, and that is we are to continue in a courageous witness for Jesus Christ. Notice what it says. The Lord is my helper, therefore what? I will not fear or be afraid of what man or other people will do to me. See, we always have a fear of rejection. We have a fear of physical harm or retaliation that will occur if we share our faith with people, if we share gospel literature, if we invite people to church, that they'll be mean to us. And I'm not saying that that's always going to be the case where you're going to have an, a great experience like I had last year down there, because several years ago, I was at a gas station in Springfield, Missouri, and I wanted to hand a gospel tract to a guy in a pickup truck in front of me. And uh, I started to go hand him the track and say, hey, sir, excuse me, I'd like to share a gospel track. And he immediately been scre he began screaming at the top of his lungs, calling me every dirty word you could think of, <laughs> and rearing back like he's going to punch me. And I said, okay, no problem. <laughs> you don't want the gospel track. <laughs> I'll go to somebody else. So I went and gave it to somebody else. But this guy went berserk like he was demon-possessed. Now, you're not always going to have that experience when you go out to hand out gospel tracts, okay? But it's my habit to hand out gospel tracts at gas stations. And this time, the devil was really in this guy. <laughs> and he wanted to intimidate me, so he's ready to, to physically assault me. You know, he's trying to give him a track. Just give a gospel track. <laughs> Sir, you don't have to have it. It's all right. You know, but uh, so sometimes you'll have experiences like that. It pays to stay cool, doesn't it? Just back off, say, okay, respect their decision not to take the pamphlet. And go and give it to somebody else. The other day, we were, I was down on the, a trip uh, last week, and I was giving out the gospel tracts at the gas station, another gas station. And the first four people I tried to give the tracts to did not want it. Nothing to do with it. They were really negative. And they said, nah, I don't want any of that stuff. Just, just really, really negative. And then the next six people, now it would have been easy, four people, you give the, four people reject the gospel tracts. Ah, just chuck it, forget it here. Nobody wants the gospel tracts. Four people in a row reject the gospel tracts. But the next six people in a row after the four that rejected it all received the gospel tracts. And one motorcycle dude said, hey, man, I'm a Christian too. Cool, you know, and he just gave me a hug and said, hey, that's great, man. I'm glad you're doing this. You know, so it's like, I could have quit with the first four. It's easy to get discouraged with the first four that reject you and they reject the gospel, they're rejecting God's word. But the next six are worth the effort of giving the tracts out, amen? And it's worth it if somebody gets saved and somebody comes to church, it's all worth it, amen? So you never go wrong serving Jesus because even if you're trying and people aren't responding, God's using your witness for Christ Jesus. Amen? And this gospel must be proclaimed, gospel of the kingdom must be proclaimed in all nations, and then shall the end come. He didn't say all, everybody's going to receive it. He just says it needs to be proclaimed to all nations. He says, Jesus commands us, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Ma uh, Mark 16, 15 through 16. Amen? We're to make disciples. Matthew 28. 19 through 20. And teaching those disciples to what? We were talking, Phyllis and I were talking about that this morning. <clears throat> teaching the disciples to do what? To keep all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Matthew 28, 20. A lot of times you hear the Great Commission without the Matthew 28, 20 part. That's the third part of the Great Commission. And we have a study in the foyer. I guess they have it in the, uh, uh, the um, rack of uh, Bible studies there uh, by the in front of uh, her office, Phyllis's office there, and it has one of the studies of the basics of biblical discipleship. If you've never read that or studied it, uh, pick up a copy. It's absolutely free, right, Phyllis? And uh, you can pick that up, and all that does is present the basics of what it means to be a biblical disciple. And the third part of the Great Commission is learning to keep or being a doer of the commands of Christ. How many commands of Christ are there? Do you remember? I taught this years ago here. <laughs> Some of you probably forget, right? At least 72. The last 70, there's at least 72 New Testament commands of Christ. That will probably shock people, won't it? So we need to learn, start learning them one by one. But that was the priority to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. A lot of times we learn the theology of this or the theology of that first instead of learning the basics, which Jesus says, teaching them to... Now, what, what did he say? How do we disciple? What was Christ's methodology? Teaching them to observe or keep all things whatsoever I have taught you. 
Jesus said, no. Jesus said, specifically, commanded you. You can look that up in the Greek text. There's a difference, friends. A command is an imperative voice. It is a must. It is not optional for us Christians. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. In, in John 14, 23, uh, 21, Jesus said, He, implying she also, that hath my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me shall I love to my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest or reveal myself to him. John 14, 23. Friends, that's real relationship. And that real relationship with Christ is dependent on our obedience. You can't say that you're having a true relationship with Jesus Christ if you're not living in obedience to Christ daily and not submitting to his commands in your life. When God says, hey, you need to correct this, when God's convicting our hearts about a sin in our life, a, a sin stronghold, a sin habit that we need to depart from and leave, he's, he's speaking to us through his Holy Spirit, through his word. He doesn't say, well, you can leave it when you're ready. He says, repent. Amen. <laughs> he says, now, let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from sin, depart from iniquity. Amen? Amen. He commands us. He says, you need to do this now. Now imagine if, how many of you guys have been in the military? Raise your hands. Imagine, you guys have been in military men. What would happen if your company commander said to you, soldier, I need you to go over here right now. Go, go take care of that right now. What if you said to him, well, sir, I'm doing something else right now. And could I do that like, you know, like tomorrow or something like that? Would that work better? Would that be okay? And what would he say to you? <laughs> He'd probably raise his voice, wouldn't he? You might end up in the brig. You might end up in trouble, right? What if you're in a battle and the general or the, or the colonel, the major, whoever's in charge, or, your co or the captain, he says, soldier, go over there and do that right now. And you don't do that. The whole battle could depend on your obedience, couldn't it? The outcome of the battle. And it's the same in the Lord's work. When God commands us to do something, we must do it immediately, ASAP. And how much more should we be willing to obey our captain, the captain of our faith, Jesus Christ, our general and eternal king, Jesus Christ, when he commands us to do something, amen? When Jesus says, forgive them, boy, they know not what they're doing. Jesus says, forgive, and you shall be forgiven, Luke 6, 37. And yet, we as Christians, a lot of times we wrestle, oh, I can't forgive that man. I remember a lady years ago shared, I can't forgive that pastor for what he did years ago. To hurt, a, to hurt me and my family. I can't forgive him. Now this happened like years before in this lady's life. Friends, what is that revealing? This lady had a problem with a disobedience in her heart to Jesus, to his word. Because Jesus commands us, forgive, you must forgive and you will be forgiven. The Bible says, look, if you forgive not men your trespasses, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. So we have to say, hey, we forgive them. Now, there's a difference between forgiveness and trust, amen? Somebody can burn you one time, <laughs> do you evil, all right? Now, you, we are commanded to forgive them, not hold it against, not seek to actively avenge ourselves against that person for that action, amen? To leave vengeance to God. But at the same time, we learn, if you keep getting burned, you keep letting yourself be trapped by the same, same thing over and over again. Friends, that's not God's problem, okay? Yeah, we're going to forgive that person, but trust is a different issue. You, don't, you can forgive a person without trusting them. Amen? Okay, you can forgive one of these communist dictators or imams or whatever for, for you know, inciting people to kill Christians, but that doesn't mean we have to trust them. Amen? See, there's a difference between forgiveness and trust. Trust is earned. Trust is respected. Now, I trust Brother Strong because he's my friend. Amen? And I trust uh, that he's going to do me good because I've known him for years. And he's been a blessing. He prays for him and Carol and pray for my ministry. And I love you guys, and you guys are my dear friends in Christ Jesus. And, and I trust different ones here because I, I know, I've known you for years. I trust Phyllis <laughs> and her husband Jim. Amen? I've known... Uh, our sister uh, Janice, and I trust Phyllis too. She's been here for many years. But I trust Janice because, 
hey, I know she wants to do me good. Every, every year they gather pencils and they gather carry-ons and everything they send down. They supply us for I don't know, how many years now, Jen? I have, I have no idea. But that is such an encouragement to us. I know she wants to do me good. I know she's going to do me good because she's a friend. Amen? And so it's a lot easier to forgive somebody you know, that, you, that you trust, that you know that, you know, like, we all make mistakes and somebody can do something, have a bad day, right? And, and, and mess up. But, you know, it's a whole different thing when somebody intentionally over and over and over seeks to hurt you. At a certain point, you have to say, okay, I forgive that person, but the Bible says avoid them. <laughs> Romans 16, 17. They're continually seeking to do you hurt, okay? Yeah, it's, it's a time to separate. The Bible says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, 2 Corinthians 6. Well, for what fellowship hath Christ with Belial or the devil? What fellowship has, has a Christian or a believer with an unbeliever? Well, there's a big difference because we have a different spiritual father. We have God our, as our father. When we're born again, when we know Jesus, Lord and Savior, and we're a Christian, the, those who are not yet saved are born again. The devil is still their spiritual father. So the devil inspires them to do a lot of bad stuff. You wonder how people do the things that they do. You read the newspaper. You, you, you turn your news on in the evening in the, in the cable news, and you hear these incredible reports. People do the most horrific things, mass shootings and all this stuff. How can a person do that? Because their spiritual father is the devil, and the devil can possess them at any time to do the most horrific, vile things you can imagine. And I've learned that there is, the depravity of humanity is exceedingly great, friends. And it's demonstrated daily in the newspapers, daily in the, news, in the news stations. And we think, how could people be that evil? Man, that's, the, that's like evil personified. But they do that because the devil is their spiritual father. And the devil is the father and inspire, inspire the origin, the inspiration for all murders, mass murders, lies, false philosophies, deceptions in the world today. And so those who serve the devil are known by being liars and murderers and mass murderers and deceptive and, and they never want to speak the truth or follow him who declares the truth, who is our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father, but by who? By me. In Acts 4.12, Jesus declare, or Peter declared, the Apostle Peter, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. There's no other way to heaven. There's no other name that will give us to heaven. That's why we teach the folks that come to know Christ in Mexico, you don't want to pray to Mary because your prayers are not going to be answered because Mary is in heaven. She's a saint, okay? But a saint is not our mediator. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, 5, the Apostle Paul declared, for there is one how many? One mediator between God and men, the man who? Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6. So we know that there's only one mediator, and it's not Mary, it's not Peter, John, or James, or it's not the Pope, and it's not the priest, and it's not the preacher, and it's not the deacon, and it's not the prophet, or it's not whoever. Okay? There's only one, and that's Jesus Christ. So when we pray to God the Father, we pray in the name of who? Jesus Christ. Now, friends, this is pretty clear. You say, how do you know that there's power in the name of Jesus Christ? How do you know there's power in the blood of Christ? Because God answers prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen? I can testify to hundreds of prayers in my personal experience and journey with Christ since I got saved in 1979, in which he has specifically answered my prayers in the name of Jesus. And I stopped recording. I should have kept recording them, Brother Strong. I should have kept, I had a journal when I started, and after so many, I just said, hey, this is cool. <laughs> I just lost it. There's just so many prayers, I can't keep up with them that are being answered. Isn't that awesome? God is an awesome God. There's nothing that's impossible with God. Praise Jesus. And friends, there's power in the name of Jesus Christ. There's power in the blood of Christ. But friends, that's why the devil and his people don't like it when we pray publicly in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now friends, it's amazing when you read the newspapers, uh, these people are forbidding in this company, forbidden in the military, forbidden in the Air Force. Uh, they can't now pray. The chaplains supposedly years ago, they said they couldn't pray in the name of Jesus in one of the bases. I guess one of the commanders decided he didn't want to hear prayers in the name of Jesus. That offended him. And friends, I'm telling you, you say, why did that happen? Because you see there's a spiritual battle that's going on. You see, you can pray in the name of 
a lot of different names and Buddha, you can pray in the name of Muhammad, you can pray in the name of Allah, you can pray in the name of Krishna, you can pray, all these different names that people pray and nobody gets upset. But when you pray in the name of who? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> you say, why? Because there's power, spiritual power in the name of Jesus, in the blood of Christ. The devil hates it. And the devil doesn't want it. And he says, I can't stand it. So he speaks through his people, his, his antichrist, his anti-Bible people, his anti-unsaved, unbelieving people. And he wants to shut us up and intimidate us in silence. And I hope all those Air Force chaplains continue to pray in the name of Jesus. Amen? God bless them. I know I signed a petition recently to protect a chaplain who was being attacked for teaching uh, biblical marriage and taking a stand about the issue of homosexual marriage on his base. And he, he may very well be court-martialed. And I encourage you guys to get on AFA, American Family Association. They've got a, a petition being taken. They have about 10,000 signatures. But I think we ought to have thousands and thousands of Christians signing up to support this faithful chaplain because he's a faithful Christian pastor and preacher. And he was teaching the truth about marriage, just like I taught you this morning. And so if they were to court-martial me for telling you the truth about marriage or, or about prayer or about whatever issue, I would count that as a great honor, <laughs> but I think it's unfair, and we ought to pray that God would move upon the hearts of the leaders and also recognize that as an unconstitutional action because that chaplain has First Amendment rights, friends, to pray any way he sees fit to pray. Amen? Um, that is, a, that is a, that a constitutional, but it's also a biblical teaching, and it's a faithful teaching for us Christians. We pray to God the Father in the name of Jesus, and we're not ashamed of the name of Jesus. Amen? Like Paul declared in Romans 1, 16 through 17, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Romans 1, 16 through 17. So we know that Paul was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ or his name or his message of salvation. And so let us not be ashamed either. Amen? Let us continue to praise and preach and uh, teach and witness for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So in, in, uh, in review, seven things he wants us to continue in. Continue in Christian love. Continue in Christian hospitality. Uh, continue uh, to pray for and help those who are in prison or suffering persecution in the body of Christ. Uh, continue in uh, sexual purity. Four, continue to be content with what things that God has given us, not being covetous in our hearts. Uh, six, continuing to confess and to believe that the Lord is our helper every day. And therefore, we don't have to be afraid and be stressed or worried about how we're going to get by. And then seventh, that we will continue to have a bold and a courageous witness for Jesus Christ to fear no man but to fear only sinning against our God. Amen? Amen? For the fear of God is the beginning of all knowledge, the beginning of all wisdom, as Proverbs teaches us. And so we need to have a healthy fear of sinning against God. Not to live in the spirit of fear, but to live every second with a, with a, a wholehearted desire to be afraid to sin against God, to be afraid to depart from serving God, to be afraid from stopping uh, being faithful at church, from, from be, having a fear to discontinue witnessing and sharing our faith, for having a fear of being silenced into intimidation by unbelievers. Let's continue to be bold witnesses for Jesus Christ, and one day we'll have a reward. For every soul that gets saved, it's worth it all. The first four people, like I had the experience the other day, might reject your gospel track or your invitation to church. But the next six people after that might just receive it and might give you a hug and say, Hey, brother, thank you. That was cool. Good. Keep it up. Amen? Amen. So God will encourage you if you stay faithful. It's easy to get discouraged. But we need to keep our eyes on Christ and stay faithful to him. Amen. Continue in the things which God has called us to continue in. God bless you. If there's somebody here this morning or this afternoon now, just, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, that's cool about Dynamic Life Baptist Church. You can just keep preaching, Brother Clay tells me. Brother Strong. Amen. I was preaching at a church down I like being in Mexico too because down there they, they want me to preach long sermons, Brother Strong. I can get by with it down there. And uh, one day I preached a 45-minute sermon in a church on one of the evangelistic uh, uh, 
outreaches. And the pastor came up to me later and says, Brother, are you okay? Are you sick or something? He said, you only preach 45 minutes. <laughs> so they're used to me preaching longer down there, so I can get by with it. Amen. But we appreciate you guys hearing this message and staying with us patiently, thinking on the Word of God, studying God's Word with us. And I pray that something that's been said has been encouraged.